Um, great, let's start now. Uh, thank you everyone for joining in on our session. Uh, welcome to Good Business Lab's panel discussion on the topic, Championing Worker Voice, the Role of Technology in Promoting Worker Wellbeing. My name is Bethamihi Joyce Aim, and I'll be the moderator for the session today. Um, as we start, uh, I can, uh, can I request participants to introduce them, themselves on the chat box? Please feel free to share your name, organization, and email address so that we can stay connected. And you can also uh, network with other participants. Um, if the chat box uh, is, is something that isn't accessible, you can also feel free to drop it um, in the Q&A link, but um, this is not mandatory, just something that uh, you can feel free to do. This webinar is held as a virtual side session under the United Nations Business and Human Rights Forum, Asia Pacific, which is currently being held from 6 to 9 June in Bangkok, Thailand. As we know, business and human rights, the theme of this conference promotes concern for human rights as part of core business practice. It is a recognition of the need to prevent and address risk related to human rights in business activities. Importantly, it also demonstrates that businesses that respect human rights build sustainable relationships, mutually beneficial relationships with their stakeholders, including customers, communities, investors, and in our case, our important stakeholder group of workers. So I'm going to start with a quick introduction of a Good Business Lab, um, which is hosting today's uh, side session. And then uh, we will move on to the panel discussion. After the panel discussion, we will have an exclusive showcase of a worker voice tool in Archie, which has been developed at GBL itself. So um, yeah, quickly going through what GBL does and what we're all about. At Good Business Lab, we believe that leveraging private sector to better conditions for workers is the most sustainable way to transform global labor markets. We are a not-for-profit labor innovation and research organization, and we use rigorous research methods to find a common ground between worker well-being and business interests. Our mission is to lead businesses to improve the lives of all workers. And we do this uh, in a number of ways. We identify workers' needs, design solutions, evaluate and test for well-being, and then drive the adoption of those proven solutions. And that has also been done um, through scaling up technologies, uh, which are research-backed. Can we go ahead? Yeah. So quickly running through some of the focus areas of uh, GBL and some of the things that drive our research and our work. We work on unlocking female labor, closing the skill gap, improving work environment, and building holistic health. So you can see that we work across the journey of employment from freeing up women to actually join paid work and maximizing vocational skills, soft skills, improving the quality of work environment, and looking at health from a mental health as well as a physical health perspective at the workplace. Our research has led us to evidence that speaks to the significance of worker voice, which is today's topic. Um, worker voice or worker management communications makes workers feel valued and contributes to an improvement in worker well-being and business interests. So I won't go too much into this because today's topic is going to cover this extensively. We have experts both from industry as well as people who have worked heavily with workers and consumers and labor here on this panel today. Our panel is aligned with the theme of the forum, which is from commitment to action. So this is our commitment in terms of what we want to do with Worker Voice, but we also want to bring action in terms of implementation of Worker Voice tools, such as the ones that will be um, discussed and talked about in today's panel. Uh, before we get into the meat of the discussion, I would like to introduce our speakers for today. Um, we start with Shruti Singh, Country Head Fashion Revolution. So Shruti has been an advocate for sustainability, climate justice, transparency, um, workers' rights in the fashion industry for over 14 years. She's been dedicated to promoting a fashion industry which is clean, safe, fair, transparent, and accountable. She currently leads um, uh, the India Office of Fashion Revolution, an international advocacy organization. 
Next, we have Soumya, uh, Soumya V, who is a social program specialist at H&M India. So Soumya's work has been focused on the welfare of workers in the supply chain, and she also has had over 14 years of experience in business and sustainability. She's passionate about creating a seamless environment uh, for people uh, who are at their job, and this includes being treated um, in the right way um, in their professional space and time. Next, uh, we have Ayushi Ghosh. She's Senior Executive Communications and Sustainability Innovation at Shahi Exports. Uh, Ayushi's interdisciplinary education in data-driven um, communications and change management has led her to her work now at Shahi. At Shahi, she focuses on stakeholder management, communications, and core focus on worker well-being, CSR, and social programs at Shahi Exports. Shahi Exports is India's largest ready-made garments firm, um, employs over 100,000 workers. So definitely a major stakeholder when we're talking about uh, worker well-being. And finally, we have Mamta Pamoli, who is the Associate Director of Ventures at Good Business Lab. Uh, Mamta has worked on multiple fronts in the development sector, from partnerships, fundraising research, to now leading the tech interventions at Good Business Lab. Um, she's working on scaling the impact of GBL's proven solutions, which improve both wo uh, worker well-being outcomes as well as business returns. So um, thanks uh, for this. I will now qu quickly move on to our panelists and not take up too much time. I think our panelists will be able to answer some key questions here. I'll start with Shruti, um, a question that perhaps uh, will be quite relevant for you. Um, you've been very vocal about workers' rights and welfare and have collaborated with different groups like researchers, businesses, pol policymakers, unions, and workers across the world. So drawing from that experience, uh, you can just like, tell us what you think about worker voice at the workplace. Um, how does this help worker well-being? Um, an introduction to today's topic. Thanks. Thanks, Beth. Really happy to be part of this discussion. Um, like you mentioned, that worker voice is uh, incredibly important. Uh, as you know, fashion supply chains are really long and employ a lot of garment workers across nations, across different um, tiers of industries. And all of them are equally important uh, in shaping uh, not just the future, but how we approach the solutions going forward. Uh, I think workers, uh, to be able to um, express their opinions, their concerns, their ideas freely without any hesitation, without any power dynamics stopping them from uh, expressing themselves is a vital aspect of ensuring overall well-being of our workforce and the health of our workforce. So, and it goes beyond mere participation and tokenism saying, yes, we heard you or a survey. It's about really fostering a culture of inclusivity, respect and collaboration. And collaboration is really, really important as we are realizing that not one person has a solution, but it's a solution that we all have to come together. Uh, things are moving really, really fast. And uh, workers, we know that when they feel that their voices are valued, uh, they're respected, um, they have... Uh, there is dignity in the way we approach uh, the solutions uh, will lead to a higher job satisfaction and motivation. There are studies that prove that it, it's not just a good thing to do. It makes good business sense. And uh, when workers have a seat at the table, uh, not just including their voice, but being able to drive the decision making, especially which are uh, on topics like safety, working conditions, when they have the confidence to speak up about safety concerns, potential hazards, um, then you can identify those issues in real time, uh, in a timely manner, and you can address them promptly. It also, uh, with the, you know, because the topic talks about technology, uh, technology is really important in real time data. Uh, when you can't track something, you cannot measure its change, you are not able to uh, monitor and you are not able to know whether the solutions are uh, effectively solving the problem or not. 
Uh, at Fashion Revolution, uh, we have always advocated for transparency uh, because we believe that uh, no, you know, with technology, with data, transparency is going to be a byproduct or, or an outcome of the whole exercise. But transparency is very important when you have to ensure workers' rights, their wages, the right kind of working conditions, and for accountability of suppliers, brands, um, and to be able to take the right kind of policies as well, because when you don't have data, you're not able to do that. Uh, second, I think uh, it needs to be said that with technology, I think we can also empower workers uh, for collective bargaining to support their rights to organize, know what's happening on the ground. Um, and yeah, it's a, it's a very nuanced topic as well, because it's easier to say that worker voices should be integrated, but it's difficult to apply it in reality on grassroots uh, because there are a lot of challenges. And I think we'll get into those factors much later in the discussion. Um, but to be able to say that, um, you know, they, are, they live in these communities, there is a existing power dynamic. So it is, uh, while technology can solve a lot of things, but it has to take into account the cultural and social uh, realities of the factories and, and the people who are working and the communities around those factories as well. Yeah, th thanks so much, Shruti. Uh, very insightful. And, um, you know, you're talking about collaboration, about a business case for Worker Voice, and at the same time, how technology can be used. But completely agree that we have these challenges that we will hopefully be able to explore and, and talk about in more detail also, as well as solutions to some of these challenges. Um, drawing from what you just said just now around collaboration, around working hand in hand with workers, uh, I want to move to Ayushi, um, who's representing Shahi here. So as an organization that relies very heavily on your workforce, um, how do you view the importance of communication between workers and management? How does that collaboration come about? Are there some initiatives you've undertaken? And, um, you know, anything around grievance redressal or worker voice specifically? Thank you so much, Beth, for uh, getting us all together here and inviting me to uh, share my thoughts. Um, so just to set the context in the industry that we currently operate in, um, India being India's largest, we have more than 50 factories with like 150,000 workers. So there's a huge scale that we're talking about. And then there is the fact that the audience is involved in the self communication between management and the workers. We need to essentially understand where they uh, sort of come from and what is it that their daily concerns largely would revolve around. In order to do that, we believe that it's very important to keep the channels uh, around for understanding those daily issues because running such a large operations, um, knowing things in real time, as uh, Shruti pointed out, is definitely the most crucial thing that we have found to be, in a, you know, to be important for us. Um, now, there are two aspects of this. The first is to enable workers' voice. We first need to build the ability for an employer to listen to the worker. That means creating the channels, creating the processes or through which workers can sort of voice their concerns. And then the second and most important part of that uh, entire journey would be building the ability of workers to utilize the tool and then understand that journey that their voice will take in order to feel more comfortable and visibly see what action is being taken. So the basic framework that we then come up with is listening, understanding, and then action and remediation. And while maintaining you know constant communication with them so within our responsibility for towards our people we sort of have uh, built a governance system for this two-way communication to happen through a six pillar grievance redressal mechanism um, we have worker management committees suggestion boxes hotlines in-person complaints to hr organizational development uh, uh, people and then finally an anonymous digital uh, worker voice tool that we've developed with GBL, um, which is Inachi. Um, now, in a typical factory floor, Shahi has multiple communication channels, right? Um, so now, what ends up happening is that the to in in order to utilize those channels to its maximum level, you would want both or uh, all levels to participate um, you know, equally in that. So that means the supervisors, floor managers, and HR managers also play a very crucial role. Um, now in our uh, goal to, our goal then largely is to be, create that safe space for communicating. How do you uh, address the concerns with that come with 
uh, digital or uh, digitizing worker voice? Um, and how do you make it usable in their daily lives? Because they also do fulfill other roles. This worker voice and redressal is an important check to keep in mind, but how do you make it a part of the culture and an everyday behavior is what we try to understand. With GBL, what we've done is that we've done two studies with them on uh, utilizing such tools. The first uh, one was now in testing those tools, we will uh, dive deeper later into them for sure. But um, for now, I think it might be relevant that what we've done so far as an intervention is to test the concept of digitizing tools at such a large scale. What does it actually look like? What is the uh, you know utility rate? Uh, understanding uh, the kinds of things that come up, are there patterns, are there areas that we could analyze or look at that sort of, uh, you know, give us, you know, a leverage to then implement solutions for. Um, so the ultimate goal then is to include worker voice in ensuring meaning, meaningful action is taken uh, and we improve and support a healthy work environment for workers and also create a thriving business uh, in that process. Yeah, th thanks so much, Ayushi. I think uh, it's very impressive what Shahi has been able to do with so many workers at hand. And also, you know, these six pillars that you've mentioned with a worker voice tool sort of coming in over there as one of these pillars. Um, very important for us to note in the sense that, you know, there is a role of management to play here. Um, but, you know, Shahi represents sort of a the direct employer's perspective, the perspective that's act of of the, of the employer who's actually taking ahead a worker voice technology or tool or any other grievance redressal mechanism. But I want to bring the conversation now to sort of an indirect employer in the form of a brand. In a garment supply chain, a brand like H&M um, would sometimes face negative publicity uh, over poor working conditions. Brands in general do that. But uh, there is a strong incentive for brands to push worker well-being programs at their supplier factories, despite not being the direct employer there. So with these conversations coming up, um, I would want Soumya to comment on how uh, it what the conversation between suppliers and brands, uh, how is that changing, if at all? How do you convince a supplier to implement these programs and to make worker voice a priority? Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks, Beth, and uh, the fellow panelists to have me here on uh, speaking about, uh, you know, workers' voice. Uh, first of all, to answer to the first part of your question, you know, the change here in the conversation between the suppliers and a brand is that we are evolving more and more towards integrating sustainability into business. So the measure of the success of the social programs that we implement, you know, which invariably leads to the well-being, workers' well-being, that is a critical point that we consider during our business placements. Now, having said that, supplier ownership towards these programs are also equally important. That is where our focus shifts from, you know, a mere logistics part of the program towards the functionality of it. Because at this point of time, let's agree, every, everybody has a program, everybody has a social program, everybody has a mechanism. So the change in the conversation is not having a program in itself, but how are we going to uh, make it functional and consistently functional? So that is the conversation, that's the change in the conversation that we are having right now. Uh, to answer to your second part of the question as to how are we convincing the suppliers to you know, implement a program? Uh, I feel it is fair to say at this point of time, everybody is aware of the grievance mechanisms that are required so convincing a supplier is definitely not in a, you know a top priority for us because especially for example shahi here already they are aware of you know the requirement for a functional grievance mechanism so what we do focus on is how do we quantify the qualitative impact that a program can bring because um when we speak about programs to any of the suppliers, the initial barricade that we have is, if we implement this social program, then what is my return of investment at a quantitative level? But that is not how social programs work. So uh, social programs largely work on bringing about qualitative impact 
a classic example of workers well being right so when uh, we take programs to the suppliers our narrative becomes or includes the risks factors that are involved in it and um, the adversity that it could lead to if the workers well being is not kept at top priority so when we take our programs to the suppliers we also make sure to tell them that what is in it for them like what are the areas uh with the suppliers that they will be benefited from by implementing the programs so it could be you know lower attrition rate which will lead to improved productivity and it could be smoother execution of work leading to quality products which will ultimately lead to you know better business prospects so these are the kind of narration or you know convincing points that we use uh, when we have a dialogue or a discussion with the supplier and uh, to lastly add as a brand uh, hnm we do not get uh, territorial over the programs that we bring about because uh, to touch upon what shruti and ayushi was telling collaboration is very very important because this is not a one person's job so we are more than willing to work with the suppliers with their programs as well because ultimately our uh, sole Uh, goal is uh, you know workers well being so without losing sight of that bigger picture we work towards our programs thank you so much somia um i think you answered this in the best way that sustainability and workers well being is definitely a priority for everyone now so it's a matter of how to do it best um you also mentioned uh, you know the business case for worker voice um lower attrition other business interests higher productivity and so on and in fact gbl has also done its research heavily on topics such as these having evidence to actually show the same so since our inception in fact gbl has been working on worker voice and have found that it is beneficial to both businesses and workers so i'll take this question now to uh, mamta um could you share some key findings from gbl's research over the years with our audience um why uh, also did gbl decide to move away from just pure research and actually leverage technology considering also that there are existing channels for workers to voice their concerns sure uh first of all thank you so much for having me here um and um yes the ability to voice is extremely impactful uh we have evaluated worker voice in three research studies now and a couple of them i usually already mentioned um and what we have found is that providing workers with the channel to voice their concerns has led to a reduction in worker attrition and absenteeism it has led to an increase in worker productivity and improved worker confidence in reporting cases we're going to share i mean i'll share a couple papers um and a few other links in the chat that go into the details of these research studies that you know uh, the audience can go at, in their free time now um to answer the second part of your question why did we just not stop at research and want to scale uh, the technology is because uh we think scale can be achieved when you know we we want to achieve that scale not not just create evidence and stop at that um but yes there are many existing analog channels of communication between workers and management i should already mention the suggestion boxes worker hotlines um or even just directly approaching the factory hr right um at least in the context of the indian blue collar workforce they have made complete sense they are economical they cater to low literacy levels they're easy to use by workers however manufacturing workforce today is larger than ever and the working conditions in the sector have become a topic of concern globally in the light of that grievance redressal has come to the forefront when we speak about working conditions in factories we did exploratory research to understand the effectiveness of these traditional channels of communication and we found that they are very underutilized because of fear of retaliation there is a lack of transparency and visibility into the journey of a concern raised by a worker there's lack of accountability among other issues that you run into with more analog or sort of manual methods and today technology is ubiquitous it's affecting the majority if not all aspects of our lives and so it wasn't difficult to decide that we could use 
tech to solve for these shortcomings. However, as I mentioned earlier, if you are familiar with the demographic of the blue collar workforce in India, leveraging technology to be effective comes with its own set of challenges. And the key challenge for us right now actually remains access. Yeah, th thanks so much, uh, Mamta. That that makes a lot of sense. And I think, you know, this whole technology discussion is leading us to more, um, you know, um, important questions also around rolling out tech interventions, what exactly that means and so on. So I think probably the best person to um, answer the, ne the next question will be Ayushi. Um, because as a supplier who's actually rolled out a tech intervention, I'm sure you might have faced some obstacles. How do you think workers respond to such interventions within factories? And is there a level of resistance or is there an openness to it? Um, your comments on that. Hi, thank you so much, Mamza, for sharing the insights from the studies. Um, and we've been working closely with GBL and understanding um, these issues uh, that do crop up with uh, work environments. And uh, as I said, it is a priority for us as an employer for the well-being. Uh, one part is like you roll out uh, programs that empower workers on different aspects like soft skills and technical training. But then there are other things that definitely need to be addressed for which we have these grievance redressal mechanisms, which traditionally have been more analog. Um, but to, to bring in a digitized version of it, there have obviously been um, some uh, challenges to it. Uh, the understanding that there is a need for digitization is something that was quite apparent. Um, again, with uh, the scale that we operate in and the, and the expense that we hold, it made absolute sense to digitize things. But now what needs to be done is how do you bridge the gap that exists um, in the two levels that are very essential to the adoption of such a uh, product or a tool. So during the randomized control trials that we had conducted, uh, both treatment and control groups did have access to the tool. So what is it that we were testing? We were testing uh, what was the ease of using the tool? What is the impact of training and constant reminders? How do you like to address the point about underutilization of these traditional channels? We had to really find out how is it that we can increase more awareness, get workers to use it, um, and then, of course, like um, build and uh, build a use case for the management as well, which is directly implementing this on the ground, because we have six channels. So managing those six channels is also a big task. Um, and how do you equip them to do it uh, in the best manner possible? So I'll start with the challenges that appear for the perception that the workers hold when it comes to such tools. Um, the initial and the most and the biggest concern is trust. Uh, how do you trust the digital tool? With, uh, with the audience that we currently have, the blue collar uh, audience, um, education levels might not be the same across. While there are varying ranges of that uh, understanding and digital literacy, financial literacy, there are a lot of those topics that need to be explained or need to be given information about at the beginning when they're starting their employment journey with us. Now that they have that, how do they make sure that their concerns and the issues that they face on a daily basis are also addressed effectively? So to trust the process, what we have realized, to help them trust the process, what we've realized is that constant training, bringing it up, SMS reminders that, you know, hey, this tool exists. Um, a lot of times, initially, we've only received messages like, hi, hello, because they just wanted to try it. They just wanted to test it. What is it? So there was a curiosity for sure. So there is definitely a level of curiosity that they began with, but as and when more and more people started using the tool, what we found was they appreciated the fact that there was a two-way communication and they were told about the status of their cases. Um, we definitely, our teams had to, you know, constantly pursue for more information because not, not every worker would be able to directly put it down in a message or put it down in a voice message initially, because this is the first time that they're trying to do that with a tool which is so separated uh, from their, you know, usual uh, channels. So that has definitely been uh, a process that we have utilized and sort of, you know, used. And because um, we've also been able to buffer it with 
uh, the existence of our organizational development team, which is a very neutral team that is responsible for making sure that they are, they are constantly there to answer questions, to help people out through processes. They're the implementation partners for us for the um, different programs that we run in our factory. So they also serve as their network and their understanding of the workers also helps makes them key people who are able to uh, help workers out in order to transition to this new tool. Um, then the Beyond this, I feel like with all this training, uh, there also comes the concern of attrition. With more amount of attrition, we have to repeat trainings. It's largely a big task to undertake, but we have to ensure that in order to make sure that um, the people are utilizing this tool. For factory floor, uh, for factory management uh, specifically, um, there are questions about the utility of such a tool, duplication of work, those kind of questions are more change management oriented, especially at this stage when we have tested it and we found positive results. Um, how is it that we you know, encourage them to uh, adopt this as a measure? So what we found is that incentivizing the HR management, which is responsible for undertaking this entire project, has definitely given us results. A part of the data um, that we have from the results is that they were able to close 95% of the, they were able to resolve 95% of the complaints that came in through NRJ, and 90% of them came with a satisfied rating, which definitely shows that there's, you know, a direct relationship with the incentive that we have been able to provide for them so that they are also able to see how their daily efforts are positively affirmed and sort of given encouragement um, in order to also communicate the importance that worker voice holds in our systems. So uh, yeah, uh, and the last bit of a challenge that we're still sort of working out is determining how, uh, determining, determining a standard method of analysis of the reports that we get. How do we use that information? Um, how do we use that data effectively? Do you maybe modify, adjust anything uh, that we run in the factory floor? We want to be able to utilize that information more effectively. Um, this is a more uh, larger scheme of things that we are trying to work towards, and this is a very exciting uh, journey, I hope, uh, that will help us, you know, sort of complete the loop for Worker Voice. Thank you, Ayushi. I think you've covered a lot in terms of the experience that Shahi has had in actually rolling out an intervention, everything from the learnings to the change management, incentives for HR, again, very unique kind of innovative approach and what the way forward will look like in terms of analysis of the information and data that you do receive. Um, I mean, your uh, information has now come in through the experience, but I want to move now to Shruti. Um, in your experience and working with uh, campaigns, worker voice campaigns, understanding what supply chain transparency, ethical sourcing and other, and other issues like these, what these mean. Um, what about the design of the tool itself? Um, do you think that there are some factors that need to be kept in mind in designing these kind of technology solutions? Are there any challenges and prevalent solutions um, that you are aware of? I think most of the technology solutions need to uh, you know, uh, consider a few things, few factors, or some challenges that currently we are being told uh, that they have to overcome. Uh, one of them is accessibility, uh, because technology should be, of course, user friendly. The design should be user friendly. It should be accessible to people with a uh, varying level of digital literacy and language skills uh, as well, because sometimes you are procuring from various different uh, countries, parts of the countries, parts of the globe. Um, so does it uh, support and accommodate uh, such a diverse works, workforce? Um, is it supported in multiple languages? Uh, does it take into consideration the cultural Im implications? Um, because language barriers can limit the effectiveness of the communication through the tool. And um, cultural difference, if not um, taken into account, uh, can have different um, responses from different parts of the factories or different parts of the world where the factory is located and can impact the workers' willingness to work with those technology uh, solutions. Uh, so the design should be intuitive and accommodate uh, that so that workers can, of course, uh, voice their opinions uh, regardless of their level of digital uh, expertise. Um, 
another thing is uh, inclusivity you know and when i talk about inclusivity it also talks about disabilities or uh, learning disabilities uh do their features in tech accommodate and incorporate that as well uh that's also important uh do are you able to adjust very simple things like adjusting font sizes um you know because you can also have people who are not um require support in uh, reading that um and one thing that ayushi also mentioned is uh, anonymity and privacy because with all the tech solutions that come in who owns the data who's keeping the data what about workers privacy uh providing mechanisms that truly have anonymized feedback uh can uh, you know give confidence to the workers that there won't there won't be retribution there won't be backlash and uh can help build that trust um and workers may be you know hesitant because um negative consequences are possible so for example if a brand has a technological solution uh but at the factory level they don't have confidence that you know if they report it what will happen and sometimes what happens is the true reality is if they get thrown out of a job they lose their job uh, for speaking out um how do how do brands take care of that does technology also does the platform also integrate that uh, beyond their work uh, space so there are some practical issues which obviously need to be uh, taken care of and um, lastly i would say scalability because the advantage of technology is that it can be scalable uh, but will the solution that we're working on today be able to handle large volume of feedback will it still be that effective uh, and adapt to the needs of a growing organization um the, those are important things to consider um how long would the data be stored um and like ayushi mentioned they're still figuring out how will the data be used so all of these things are uh, really important and i think these are the factors and also the challenges uh when it comes to developing and designing a uh, technological uh, intervention so for example i can tell you like uh at we have something called as fashion transparency index which is the global index that um, has different criteria for evaluating how transparent a brand is and one of the factors is it's not just enough that a brand has a policy or a solution um um you know uh, for worker welfare but do the workers really know about how to engage it is is that policy available in their language is it easily accessible without asking their superiors for it um so are they able to access it all on their own uh without uh, asking anyone else because that is also really important in making sure the they are able to operate it solo and that's how anonymity can also be uh, upheld so those are some of the things that come to mind when you talk about factors yeah th thank you so much shruti i think a lot of what you're speaking about is something that we've also been very concerned about in terms of anonymity um, being multilingual inclusivity and such and i think these are very important um factors to keep in mind when when designing tech solutions uh probably mamta you could answer being somebody who has worked on the design of a new tool um you know all these things factors you you've kept in mind but apart from this uh you, when you're creating a new tool you also have to consult and address the needs of very different kinds of stakeholders and sometimes these stakeholders um uh, may have conflicting interests so how do you ensure that power dynamics that already exist between brands suppliers workers um don't negatively influence decisions um around how the tool is used and the way that the tool serves everyone yeah thank you for that question um i first uh, i think i want to thank shruti for sharing that i think that's really valuable we definitely you know see ourselves checking a lot of boxes but of course not all and um the things that you mentioned about um uh you know the inclusivity bit especially i mean we think of inclusivity there are so many several parameters that one can think about and i think that's really uh really useful to just hear um okay about the question um i'm not sure if the um outcome we all want to achieve is conflicting uh, i'm talking about the stakeholders that you've mentioned and uh, to be honest this is slightly a difficult question to answer because the decision making is continuous and uh, really depends on the concern or question at hand 
It is a balancing act, yes. Workers, suppliers, brands are all very important stakeholders to us, and we want the tool to be as useful as possible to all of them. However, there are a few things that do simplify the decision-making process for us. One of which is an understanding that we do not want to take agency away from any of these parties. Um, for those who are familiar with Good Business Lab's work, our mission remains at the core of what we do. We want to build solutions that improve the well-being of workers, and in that, they also benefit the employers. Uh, we know this is possible because we have studied this and we have proven this. Um, next, we direct our efforts to convince the employers of these benefits and encourage them to adopt our solutions. Of course, adoption doesn't always equal use, um, and that's something you know we, we definitely want to work on more and more. Um, and because we want the solution to be as useful as to them as can be, this means understanding the status quo um, and figuring out how to build something that suits their needs and reduces effort and friction on their end. Um, and the final stakeholder, the brand, our effects are dedicated to make them see the value in our tool in terms of how it can not only make their supply chains more efficient, um, but can also help meet the growing demands of the regulatory landscape. Uh, but I, I don't think brands need a lot of convincing at this point. They are also the ones who are really um, driving the narrative here. However, uh, when it comes to a, the relationship between a brand and a supplier, we act upon what they mutually decide. As I said, agency is important and we're not going to help anybody if we take that agency away from you know, any of the stakeholders that you mentioned. Yeah, th thank you, Mamta. Such an important, I think, point around agency. The fact that we are looking at agency of all three stakeholders here, the supplier with their data, the brand with the kind of uh, push that they have and the, their own um, you know, motivations and then workers who are actually voicing out concerns and grievances. Um, you're, you mentioned in your uh, answer about how we want the tool to be um, of value to the brand also, both in terms of transparency as well as regulate, regulation and compliance. So I think uh, it's fitting for Soumya to answer the next question. Um, we know that technological tools offer the ability to digitize grievances, complaints, communications, suggestions, so on. Um, and brands can better understand the work environment within their supplier factories. So, um, Samia, how do you think this uh, technology and digital transformation has helped you boost transparency within your global supply chains? And um, how can brands and suppliers uh, work together to mutually improve the work, the well-being of all workers who are involved in, in the entire supply chain. Yeah. Um, so the digital transformation that when we speak about has helped to remove a lot of, you know, multiple layers of uh, manual communication. So since the more the layers, you know, the risk of uh, dilution, uh, you know, or, or delay in addressing of these issues are possible. So because when these issues are not data driven, but people driven, then it becomes more subjective than objective. So this technology and, you know, advancement brings about the objectivity in these kind of issues, which is very, very critical for us. And uh, secondly, technology um, advancement has also led to a structured approach toward grievances, uh, which leads to improved accountability on both sides. Um, and uh, one of the most important uh, roles I feel the technology brings in over here is the immediacy factor you know, which helps us to access these complaints on priority basis um, and adding to the transparency as well. And the immediacy factor not only helps to address it on time, but also we are able to see a pattern. You know, we have a baseline, we're able to see a pattern, and then we are also able to proactively work on uh, the grievance complaints, um, especially speaking on the transparency. The uh, advancement, or the kind of advancement that the technology has, especially any kind of digital grievance apps, uh, having something like a live dashboard option. That's the epitome of transparency so, because we all keep speaking about transparency, but here we have, you know, uh, an app uh, and availability to prove a transparency. So it also works at multiple levels. And um, while uh, 
Ayushi and uh, Shruti have extensively spoken about the challenges and the uses of uh, you know um, uh, digital grievance app. Uh, the intimidation factor about technology, I think that is also something that we will have to address. Uh, as much as we have grown, the whole world is moving towards digital grievances, there is still a large amount of workforce or anybody, you and I also, quite intimidated with anything to do with technology. We are like, even to the physical act of, okay, if we press this button, okay, will our information go? Like the anonymity aspect, especially when workers are trying to reach out to us on sensitive issues. So there the reiteration of the anonymity aspect, either through demos or uh, through constant training, like how Ayushu was telling is really, really required for us to know the actual scenario that's happening. Um, when to answer the second part of your question on how suppliers and brands can, you know, mutually work for the better of uh, worker well-being, I think we will have to sustain a traditional way. And when I mean a traditional way, it's like irrespective of the presence or absence of the grievances for that particular month or like, you know, quarterly or irrespective of the magnitude of the grievances, uh, you know, brands and suppliers will have to meet periodically in a consistent way to keep in touch, you know, and uh, to discuss about the grievances, to address them and uh, solve the complaints. So it's it's a lot to do with collaboration, but in a consistent way, uh, not after an issue has happened, but even before it could happen. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Somia. Um, definitely very, very significant point on consistency. I think that with any kind of um, tool or any kind of intervention that we are trying to do with our workforce, there needs to be a consistency in the way that it's being done. Um, and of course, uh, it does boost so many things like accountability, transparency, and immediacy. Um, before we move on to the next set of questions, I just wanted to quickly announce, I think some participants are raising their hands. So can you please um, input your uh, questions and answers into the Q&A box? And uh, we will uh, answer after this. Um, and uh, for now, we'll move on uh, with the discussion. Uh, yeah, Shruti, uh, would you like to add to Soumya's point? I see your uh, hand is also raised. No, sorry, that was a mistake. I just put it. Yeah. There. No, no worries. Yeah. All right. Okay, great. Uh, thanks uh, again. Um, in fact, Shruti, my next question is for you. Um, how do you think technology has transformed workers' well-being in the supply chain in the last decade, having been in the fashion industry for so long, seeing so, so much of it? Um, do you think that the impact of worker well-being interventions um, differ from place to place, from country to country? Um, what are the other factors like gender, um, production, so on? Um, and also, have various global policy changes um, influenced the changes and in interventions that we've see, seen? Thanks, Beth. I think uh, when we talk about technology and worker voice, I would uh, also like to share what um, we do from the consumer, you know, bridging the gap between consumer and workers. So regular technology, like having social media uh, platforms have really helped integrate um, and, and bridge the gap between consumers who are asking, for example, we have a campaign, who made my clothes? So it's a very simple question. They're asking brands. Brands are responding over time saying, these are the people who've made your clothes. So people are coming in, sharing stories. Um, there are a lot of brands who are also facilitating interaction between workers um, and consumers, because I think that's a very important aspect of uh, building not just transparency, trust, uh, but also solidarity and understanding why clothes need to cost a certain amount, uh, what goes into making of those clothes, um, the skill of the people who are making it. So it builds that sense of humanizing the supply chain because when you buy clothes from a retail uh, retail store, you don't know the story behind it. So I think technology overall in the last um, few years, decade has made that change uh, because you are able to access people, you are able to access brands, you're able to ask questions and you're able to have a healthy dialogue. And uh, the fact that we're all sitting today in different parts 
of the country, of parts of the world, and are able to talk about uh, important issues that matter. I think that's really important. Uh, on the supply chain side, uh, we know that uh, from the examples uh, all my co-panelists have also spoken about, it has led to improved uh, communication. Uh, it has led to improved um, uh, channels of uh, conversation between workers and management. Uh, it has led to more dialogue and the ability to address concerns like uh, Soumya and uh, Ayushi also said in real time. Uh, there are mobile platforms like, for example, uh, Feb, fair phone worker app uh, that uh, enables workers to access information on their rights, on report um, uh, grievances and connect to, you know, different support networks. Um, there are apps like LabelLink, which have, again, like a worker feedback platform. Um, it collects anonymous data and allows companies to address issues. Uh, there's a technological solution that you are working on, uh, which you will present, which works on similar aspects. So I think improved communication, uh, dialogue, um, is uh, 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 has been a contribution. Uh, supply chain visibility across countries, um, and traceability, there are so many solutions that have come up, uh, uh, you know, which incorporate blockchain, uh, made it possible to track and trace products throughout the supply chain. And uh, this also helps uh, not just identify labor violations and the social factors, but also the environmental impact of uh, any information that you want to integrate uh, into it um, and has enabled people to do ethical sourcing, make right decisions on how they want to procure. Uh, it's an incredible tool, not just for brands, not just for factories, uh, but also for consumers uh, so that they know that well-being of a worker is being prioritized. Um, technology has also helped in uh, skill development and training of worker skills. Uh, so virtual training programs, uh, giving them the right uh, educational resources has enabled like different better career opportunities, a trajectory. So I think there are many ways uh, technology has helped with the training and skill development as well. Uh, of course, there are uh, other things like safe, health and uh, safety enhancements, like wearable devices, sensors, uh, which can be used to monitor workplace safety conditions, uh, detect hazards at the right time, um, you know, so smart safety helmets, um, because if you know, like fashion, fashion revolution started as a response to of uh, Rana Dhaka Plaza, Rana Plaza, factory collapse, which was completely preventable um, tragedy. Um, and I think that really prompted us to look at solutions and advocate and say, nobody, we love fashion, nobody should die uh, for fashion. And there should be better ways of producing and valuing a worker's life um, for something that we enjoy so much. We enjoy wearing the clothes that uh, we all wear. So uh, health and uh, safety, I think technology has a great ability to change that. And it's already transforming that even with the simple, simple changes. Uh, I think uh, people who are working directly with workers will say that there has been a huge difference. Uh, a lot needs to be done, uh, but a lot has happened which needs to be acknowledged. And it will only continue to grow because there are a lot of policies uh, which we have, you know, the, and I think Europe, and US are leading, in, especially Europe and France are leading in policies when it comes to transparency, when it comes to labor violations. Um, even in India, we have the Dindigul Agreement, which happened last year, which is on uh, gender-based violence. It is a binding agreement and uh, provides protection of um, you know, women and our workforce is largely women. So uh, I think there are a lot of lot of push, not just for technology, but for solutions will come from policies as well, not just brands and and from grassroots. So we see that visible change happening uh, going forward. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Shruti. I think you've mentioned some very important points, and even your last point on the policy change is very very pertinent. Um, I want to take us to a different um, discussion now, and uh, this question is for you, Ayushi. Um, we know that implementing these solutions that we've been talking so far about actually come with a monetary cost as well. Um, to the supplier, more importantly here, being the direct employer. So um, how do you build that business case, something that we have mentioned throughout, but 
what has been the experience on ground and uh, have you also implemented any changes within the organization to ensure the easy adoption of new technological solutions? Thank you so much, Beth, for the question. I think um, I'll try to answer the second part of your question first, because uh, I'd like to bring back the uh, resourcing that we've done through our organizational development team, uh, which is in which in itself is a monetary investment into resources of having one representative each dedicated specifically to help us scale these, um, uh, you know, scale these programs that we want for worker well-being in a more effective way, in a standardized way, without diluting the quality um, of that. So there has been an investment alongside a sort of uh, interest into finding out the impact of these programs. Uh, Shahi has always been a company that has appreciated evidence-based solutions, and they do tend to have a higher chance of getting adopted and scaled up into our systems. Um, we've developed that relationship with GBL and other partners to sort of uh, look at the efficacy of each of these programs. So there are considerations such as, you know, sort of efficiency, productivity, attrition, absenteeism. And with this, in this case, for uh, grievance redressal, it is more about resolution rate and the quality of resolution that we, we would want to sort of measure to, you know, finally get a holistic understanding of whether this is working or not. I've already shared some data on the resolution and the quality of resolution that we've been able to drive through our incentive system for our management. But uh, in our first pilot, we sort of uh, saw that, uh, you know, the reduction in absenteeism was by 4.7%. And uh, which with Inache, with, you know, the, the new uh, tool that we had studied recently, it has reduced further by 12.6%. This shows that there will definitely be an impact because there's a reduction in absenteeism, which means that there is an improvement in the way that people are interacting with their work environment, especially workers feel more comfortable, feel more heard. Um, it sort of drives away that, uh, you know, fear that we have been able to some sort of, in some way, communicate to them that their opinion and their voice does not have to impact their ability to work with us. Um, and that is something that is very primary for us uh, as an employer. Uh, and then, therefore, like the productivity was as well, we've seen an increase. Um, and then for that, to then inform us, what we've been able to do is take the results um, and make decisions on improving and modifying the programs that we would want to take under skills, under health, under grievance redressal, to build a, you know, a holistic uh, overview of what it, it means to then, you know, utilize that voice and create that impact that we want to. Um, now we have, what we have done is that we've committed to scaling this up 100% into our factory. So this decision and the convincing for us for digitizing worker voice is already there. Um, because all we needed to do over here was definitely share the outcomes of these results for the ones who are most impacted by this. This includes the factory management, this includes senior management, uh, includes our board. Uh, so at all levels, once this dissemination of results and the impact is shown, even they are, you know, they have a visible proof for what it does to the work environment and how that is beneficial for us as a business as well. So I think a key way to undertake that is sort of take, take that change management perspective, sort of show the results, share the results, not just with management and you know, the decision makers, but also with the workers. Because while we are able to show them that, uh, hey, your uh, this grievance of yours was resolved in this manner, are you satisfied or not? If we're also able to show what the larger impact that has in the work environment that they've created by you know, bringing back to them that, hey, we listen to you and this is the change that we will be able to bring to you. That also gives them a sense of you know, you know, purpose that you know, there is a reason why they should be escalating their voice, using their voice a little bit more uh, and feeling more confident about doing so uh, with the action that we're able to take in real time, uh, honestly. So this also means that training 100,000 plus workers on a single module without diluting quality is very, very important. Um, and with efficiency and speed at that, because we do have a nutrition issue that I've already mentioned. Um, and we've built this sort of strong uh, system um, by you know, taking this you know, testing methodology, testing the um, efficacy of things, communicating results, and then making the case for scaling it up. Um, so here the multi-stakeholder alignment is what comes in. And uh, this also includes communicating with our brands. 
um, and industry partners for that matter, to be able to you know, uh, reflect on the things that we all want to collectively address. Thank you, Akshi. Um, you've mentioned how information has helped uh, Shahi within its own management, and also the fact that you want to collaborate with the entire multi-stakeholder um, universe of you know players around uh, um, worker well-being and brands being an important uh, you know member there. So, Samia, the question is: When a brand gets this kind of data and information from within its supply chain? How do you feel it also informs larger priorities and focus areas um, in regards to worker well-being? Um, first of all, it is achieved by you know uh, creating a mechanism that directly captures the worker voice and uh, by giving weightage to it. So, and by when I mean by giving weightage to it, we also look at how we can integrate you know, this weightage into our KPIs. And uh, having said that, having, uh, the of having the technology advancement in hand, we also seek transparency from the suppliers. So once we have that, and then, you know, through collaboration, we achieve at solving the grievances and complaints. Uh, because it is impossible to know if the interventions that we take as a business, you know, uh, to be responsible and uh, have the impact that we want to see uh, without workers' voice. So, and uh, this can be derived directly from the data that, uh, you know, we are getting from these digital tools. Um, because ultimately, uh, we're all working, to, uh, you know, to ensure that the people who are making our products have decent working conditions and uh, that their rights are protected. And uh, the only way to know that is to gather the data from uh, those workers directly uh, with the help of these tools. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you so much, Samia. Um, uh, Mamta, I think, uh, you know, we want to move now to a very important question that might be on most people's minds also, since we have uh, a lot of technology and tools being discussed in this discussion. Um, but what about the other mechanisms or existing redressal mechanisms that, uh, you know, Ayushi has talked about, um, Asam has talked about. So like, do, do these, uh, do the technology, does the technology and do these tools that we're talking about, mm -hmm. do they supplement the existing redressal mechanisms? And uh, or do they or do they complement them? And at the same time, how do you get all stakeholders to trust, use, and vouch uh, for the pro product, the technological tool that we want to roll out? Yeah, um, it's difficult to answer this question without repeating a lot of what other panelists have already kind of covered. Um, all very very you know important things have been highlighted today. By the way, um, so. Early on, I emphasized that there are several shortcomings with existing analog redressal channels. A lot of them, you know, I, I guess uh, Shruti, Soumya, um, and Ayushi all went into details about uh, what those challenges could be. However, as I said, we're also very aware that using technology poses a new set of challenges. Key among them, as I already mentioned, is access. Also, Shruti mentioned that in much detail. Um, both on users and workers' end, they may feel, or indeed they do feel intimidated. We've covered that. Uh, to use technology, access to phones, smartphones, or internet may be limited or restricted, or ability to use such devices or services may also be limited. In light of all of these challenges, we are not aiming for substitution right now because we do not want workers and users to lose access to the channels of communication they trust and are comfortable using at this time, uh, right? At this time, we've instead focused on integrating the two to mitigate shortcomings of analog channels. However, having said that, in the long run, I do expect that workers and users will naturally choose to use more and more of the technology because it will be easier and more trusted. Um, and when that happens, it will eventually substitute the former. That is our hope, because I know handling six channels of communication is probably not easy. And technology will allow a supplier to reach the scale that they want to. You know, Ayushi mentioned they have like about 60 factories um, and running all those six channels in 60 factories and handling all that data manually. I don't 
I don't think it's easy. So we hope technology could save save, uh, save them that time. And uh, to be able, you know, to answer your second question, we want to be able to do all of this very successfully. So we need um, workers and users and other stakeholders affected by the tool to trust it. And to build this trust, uh, of course, we're focusing on driving utilization by workers um, and users via regular trainings. Trainings are so important. I cannot even um, begin to um, emphasize on that. Uh, providing a lot of on-the-ground support to facilitate change management. Again, Ayushi went into detail about that. Now, uh, apart from that, on the tool front itself, we are very careful about making it as user-friendly, as culturally appropriate, providing in the languages that users are comfortable using. So a lot of things that, you know, Shruti touched upon in the beginning. Um, but specifically, we've provided a functionality which enables auditing for quality of resolution um that i think that's going to be that that is really important to see how the resolution uh, has taken place um again then after that like asking for worker feedback before closing any case um, and just really trying to keep up with developing the tool so that it meets the needs of the businesses uh, we serve in that aspect i think that's all Thanks so much, Mamta. I think uh, your last comments have sort of consolidated the session so well in the sense that we have now talked about collaboration, communication, working with all our stakeholders on a very difficult and challenging topic. But when there is a clear uh, mutual uh, motivation towards worker voice and worker well-being, we see that Many of these challenges are something that we're taking head on with different solutions like training, keeping certain factors in mind while designing the tool itself, integrating the data from the grievances, the suggestions that come in into larger sustainability goals um, that uh, you know organizations may have. And yeah, the future of worker voice and grievance redressal is definitely in technology in that it is scalable. It is something that we cannot ignore in, in the present world as is. So um, with that, we come to the end of the discussion itself. But uh, we would like to take some audience questions now. So I would encourage the audience to send in their questions if you still have any left. But we'll take the ones that are uh, in the chat box right now. Um, in the interest of time, I will... Uh, sort of summarize the question and uh, club some of them together. So uh, the first one is around audits within the supply chain and the components around it. Um, we also have another attendee who's mentioned surprise audits um, to help understand uh, work abuses better. So maybe um, I would I would give this question first to Ayushi, where uh, you know with experience of audits happening in the factories and anybody else who would like to add to that. Yeah, thank you so much for the question. Um, auditing is a definitely a very important part and an important check to keep in mind when we are considering the efficacy of things. While there's data to support the, um, you know, the effectiveness of a program, it's also important to, you know, make sure that there are uh, checks in place that uh, compare it to the existing norms in the industry. So we do have uh, a comprehensive set of audits that happen almost every month for every factory. Um, this kind of data is regularly collected and we follow a framework called the SLCP. You can look it up. I can share the link in the chat as well. Um, we utilize that to at this point of time uh, more comprehensively to like um, measure the audits. I'm not the best person to comment comprehensively on how audits work and what are the components of it, but I do I do have the knowledge that you know all of this does go through scrutiny. Um, but with you know what with the in the uh, status of the current tool that we have, we are also trying to work on uh, how to utilize this in our audits uh, as well. Because aligning it with uh, industry requirements and compliance needs is something that we are exploring right now. And uh, this will require uh, a lot of uh, policy adoption, like both Shruti and Samya have mentioned before this. Creating comprehensive policies and standards for that is very essential. But all of this data and grievances uh, and redressal of grievances does undergo very thorough audits every month for every factory. 
Um, uh, to add on to Ayushi, you know, on the audit part, it is definitely required. Uh, it might be very uh, a primitive form of checking, but the surprise element in it, like surprise audits, are it, it definitely gives us a you know reality pic picture as to whatever is there in the paper. Is it in person also? That's the whole point of audit. So on-site audits do give us a you know a reality check on how much of it is being followed. Uh, and it also gives us a, a scope to have a dialogue with the factory face to face. So with that comes a lot of um, issues where we are able to solve face to face. So audits are definitely, definitely important. The components of audit, if you uh, if I have to elaborate, then uh, basically there are different uh, uh, aspects, different categories to it, different topics that we cover in audits. It could be environment, social, uh, workers' interviews, otherwise. Because why an on-site audit is more important is we get to speak to the workers. It's like hear workers' voice, but we are directly with them. Instead of they reaching to us, we are reaching to them. So that is the purpose of audits. And um, Otherwise, the reports, um, the FSL and the SLCP that Aishi was also uh, mentioning about, it is all filled in by the suppliers, by the management. Uh, but if we go directly to the you know, uh, supplier and speak, we, get, we are able to speak to the workers directly. That um, advantage we get only in audits, an on-site audit. Yeah, th thank you, Aishi. Thank you, Somya. Very uh, important, I think, the you know, your answers to this. So I'll just take one more question in the interest of time. And I would request the panelists, uh, you can also uh, type your answer uh, on the chat box if, if you want. Um, but other than this, we will try to, you can also, the attendees can also drop in their emails to us and we can try to um, respond um, afterwards as well. Uh, so, uh, yeah, let's take on the next question, which is around unionization as a solution also to worker voice and collective bargaining. I think Mamta's point around integrating technology, uh, not exactly being a substitute to all um, uh, you know, mechanisms of worker voice is very important here. So I would open this to anybody in the panel. Um, Ayushi, perhaps you might have some thoughts, Mamta or, or Shruti as well. Um, but try, uh, just in the interest of time, we'll try to quickly wrap this up within a couple of minutes and we'll move to the next section. So just very briefly, I think um, unionization is a right and a freedom of association for any worker in India. Um, and that is something that every employer must uphold. And Shahi definitely strongly believes that this is something that is a very crucial point uh, for our workers to know that they have the freedom of association. Um, but when it comes to uh, comparing it with digital tools, I agree to the uh, you know entire, it's a supplement and not supposed to completely supplant the existing mechanisms. So what I'd Basically, you know, maybe for this, for the relevance of this panel, I think it is more about actioning on worker voice in order to actually uh, implement it. These are all channels that are that are for the voice uh, to be heard. Like um, I would like to hop back to my first answer. The ability to listen is what we are focusing on and then therefore actioning from what we've heard on those channels uh, is what we should definitely focus on if we want to look at the more um, holistic view of worker voice. Thank you, Ayushi. I think you've very succinctly answered that and, and quite well as well. So um, yeah, thank you again to each and every one of you for your uh, insightful comments. Um, answers to important questions. And um, for the audience here, this entire panel discussion is being recorded. So this will be uploaded on YouTube as well after the forum is over. So we'll have access to all of this knowledge and we can continue sharing. Um, in the meantime, I will go ahead to the next part of uh, the session now, which is a very exciting showcase of the tool NRJ, which both Mamta and Ayushi have um, been talking about is in some of their answers today. So I'll hand over to Naisha from GBL to quickly introduce us and showcase how NRJ actually works. And uh, from there on, uh, we will uh, end the session. Thanks. Hey, everyone. Um, so I'm going to 
everyone. Uh, this is Naisha, and I'm the UI UX designer at GBL Under Ventures. So thank you so much, Beth, uh, for this. Uh, it's been like a great conversation happened, um, and it was really lovely hearing uh, all the panelists talking about what we've actually building and trying to come up with. Uh, in the last in the last hour, we have heard how enabling worker voice is a crucial aspect of worker well-being and mitigating challenges faced by blue-collar workers across la uh, labor-intense industries. More importantly, we have discussed how technology, when used, keeping the audience in mind, can be a powerful way to come up with like more uh, uh, effective worker voice. Uh, we at uh, GBL Ventures seek to help workers by helping businesses in their journey to be more responsible by designing tech-driven focused solutions that can be easily addressed and utilized by blue-collar workers and manufacturers across India. And one such tool and solution we have is your Inache. Inache is a two-way uh, uh, anonymized multilingual tool that helps both businesses and the workers to communicate better. It enables workers to anon anonymously like share their grievances or, or um, queries or concerns while also allowing management to effectively track, take action, and also respond to workers. Before diving a deep, uh, like deeper, we would like to bring your attention to some of our key features that, as Mamsa also shared earlier, in uh, mind of the blue collar workforce um, and its limited access to technology. Hence, having anonymity as core feature of the platform while also streamlining communication from various channels reduce a worker's de dependency on technology and lowers the appreciation associated with approaching management. Moreover, features like the analytic dashboard and single sign-on platform encourages businesses to utilize the tool to providing valuable insights and, and encourages transparency, which is also one of the most uh, uh, important thing as mentioned by Somya as well. Uh, as we discussed earlier, change needs to be achieved by keeping both the end, uh, both end of the users in mind. This is something that we have tried to do when we are uh, when we were designing an Archer. So with no further delay, let's take a look at the, um, like, let's take a look at an Archer. I would like you to, to introduce you. This is Inache. As we take you to, to uh, through the dashboard, you will see the case journey and how it has been designed to ensure that the right action is taken to uh, have, find the right uh, find the right solution for the uh, appropriate and respective concern. This is the landing page of all the users, and depending on the role they serve, the information they see on this table can be a bit different. This table records and tracks all communications received from workers who can send in their concern by calling or messaging on a 24 seven helpline number. We will now refer to individual communications received from workers as cases. Cases are anonymized and uniquely, uh, uniquely identified by a case number, which is given on the right hand side of the table. In addition to the helpline, Inache also integrates communications received from uh, existing uh, analog channels of communication, such as suggestion box, work, uh, work committee, or by like in person, which is uh, like you can just directly go to the HR and uh, talk to them about it. Now, um, let's go dive deeper into like a case report. Now, when you click like uh, click on a specific case, it takes you to a detailed report which collates all information about the case. So right after like a worker registers a query, concern, or a grievance, the case is auto automatically uploaded and is allotted to a user. In the first box, you see all the general information about the case that has been pre-filled by the platform. The message from the user is recorded in its original form. Here it shows up as a text and as a recording, both. A user now transcribes the voice, voice note and provide more information related to the case so as to um, find the optimal resolution for it. In the content of the government business we have currently serving, we are currently serving, here are some relevant details which are filled out by the user as like priority, case nature, case category, and subcategory. The case is then forwarded to another user who is supposed to like take an overlook of the case and then assign a, a relevant case troubleshooter. Case troubleshooter is basically someone who is best suited to handle the case and find an appropriate solution to the concern or query. Once resolved, the case troubleshooter will add the following details, like how the solution was enacted in terms of when, where, 
what steps were taken and how it was invented uh, and who all were involved there there is also an opportunity to provide additional details for clarity and to ensure all the parts of the concern were addressed during this process the case troubleshooter also has the ability to communicate with the worker um i i think that there is some technological issue here with nasha's um audio yeah yeah hi hi nasha we lost the, the last part sorry okay i'm so sorry the last so, 30 seconds like, during the process the troubleshooter can also like communicate with the worker through the portal itself uh, the feature is useful to acquire more information which could help the them resolve the case and to inform the worker about the status of the case which is one of the major reasons and causes which we uh, which we heard when a, uh, when a worker receives a message regarding case resolution they are asked whether they are satisfied with the solution and it's only when a worker responds in affirmation the case is closed if the worker uh, is un unsatisfied with the resolution the case gets reopened and goes through the whole process again giving all the users an opportunity to investigate differently uh, like in some cases in some companies uh, people people have more users for the same uh, work so the case is uh, um, like uh, the case is given to a different user altogether so that they can have a different perspective and overlook of the case this is to ensure that the workers are con uh, content with uh, which in turn helps them build their trust in the tool and encourages them and others to keep utilizing in our so one of the another key features what we have here is view logs all communications with a worker along with any transfer of responsibility between different users are recorded and can be viewed in uh, in this uh, uh, in this screen sorry this feature uh, helps management keep track of the case journey and in case of unsatisfactory resolution it also helps the different parts of the process to be scrutinized to understand where change might be needed quality checks and resolution satisfaction surveys tackle one of the key challenges faced by businesses when it comes to grievance redressal which is a lack of trust in the system due to limited transparency lack of anonymity and minimal to no follow ups minimum uh, in arch addresses these pain points through simple to uh, use processes resulting in significant uh, greater utilization as seen in, in our um, dashboard then another one uh, key feature of an arch is the broadcast functionality management can send uh, workspace uh, related updates or announcement to all the users and they can also like select specific groups of people and uh, a specific language of their own choice this functionality was especially helpful in communicating with workers during the peak 24 uh, covid 19 uh, pandemic yeah um yeah with with this we conclude our brief showcase of tenage and how we are uh, working towards harnessing technology to further worker voice because we truly believe that what is good for workers is also good for business this is something that interests you and um, if this is something that interests you and you want to know more uh, this is a qr where you can like scan it and there are a lot of links to links to it and please don't hesitate to like reach out to us at at the rate ventures at the rate with this is lab.org now i just handed back to beth thank you so much uh thank you so much uh, naisha um yeah that that was a really interesting um uh you know presentation of how inachi is actually used and gives us a real glimpse of what the tool actually looks like when when we're talking about worker voice and using technological tools to enable it so that was a uh, really great um, i'm sure that would have been super interesting to many of our um, audience members here um to sort of uh, conclude our session today i would like to invite priyadarshini my colleague to give us the vote of thanks and then after that um we can conclude the session thanks again to the panelists who shared all of their insights uh, in this particular session thanks beth as we near the end of the session we would just want to take a moment to thank everyone who made today possible to begin with a huge huge thank you to our speakers somya shruti ayushi mamta thank you so much for taking your time to be here and 
and to share your incredible insights. Also, a huge shout out to Beth for moderating such a great session. Um, would also like to take a moment to thank Kevin, Amy, and the rest of the UNDP team and all of their partners for one, lending us such a great platform to talk about a cause that we so strongly feel about and to also just put together such a fantastic event. Um, lastly, we can't end without thanking everyone who attended this session today. We really appreciate your participation and we look forward to seeing you at our future events. And before we close, I also want to thank Sanj, Pallavi and the rest of the GBL team who have worked tirelessly to put together to today's event and make sure all of us get the maximum value. We will also be putting the link tree links in the chat box, and we're always looking to have new conversations. So please don't hesitate to reach out, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much.